I, I must say, I'm actually a little bit nervous to be on this podcast, to be honest, okay. because despite being a wrestler and everything, um, my path into pro wrestling is kind of significantly different from most wrestlers and actually from most fans as well, because it's my experience that most wrestlers and wrestling fans started watching wrestling they were, when they were really young. Right. And then there was sort of a natural progression from, well, I love watching it, so I'm going to try it. And that's how they become wrestlers or they just love watching it. They keep watching it and they become diehard fans. Um, for me, that wasn't the case because in Australia, when I was young, uh, like wrestling was actually very difficult to access when I was a kid. Oh, really? So, yeah, well, when I was really young, when I was like, you know, five, it was wrestling was on TV in Australia. But what happened was then it got taken off free to air TV um, and it was only on cable and my house didn't have cable. Um, and like, and then when it was on free to air TV, it like the WWF had this terrible time slot when I was a teenager of like, like 1am on a Tuesday morning or something like this. So it wasn't like watching wrestling. I liked wrestling, but it wasn't really accessible. It was kind of hard to get hold of, especially when I was a teenager. Cause that was the time when I really wanted to, you know, watch it and really kind of, you know, get into wrestling. Um, if you didn't have cable in Australia, it was really difficult to access. I think it was WW. I think it was only once a week you could watch it, and then it was, yeah, two a.m. or something stupid. So occasionally I'd catch it, but um, but it was hard to follow, right? Um, and then I kind of, you know, I I'd, I'd seen wrestling and I had an interest in it because I was an actor and also a, a martial artist and a stuntman and everything. So I was like. You know, wow, wrestling, it seems like the you know, it seems like the perfect job for me because it's all character performance with the fight performance, and those are the two things that I love. Um, uh, but then the other challenge I had was in my city, there were wrestling gyms, but they were like on the other side of town. It was like an hour drive to get there and an hour drive coming back. So I didn't have the kind of the commitment to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, that meant that... I didn't get proper exposure to wrestling, like proper kind of on a weekly basis type exposure to wrestling until very late in life. And actually I didn't really get the opportunity to watch wrestling like a lot until after I'd become a wrestler, which was when I was in my mid twenties. Right. So, um, I'm a bit nervous about doing the podcast to be honest, because you know, I've listened to everyone else's uh, podcasts that you've done, like the podcasts you've done with, um, the other metalheads and whatnot. And everyone, has these awesome stories about seeing all the legendary wrestlers live when they were a kid in freaking Baltimore Civic Center and all this kind of stuff. And I don't have that kind of childhood yeah. basis to draw well, on. So, so you didn't watch wrestling at all as a kid? Like, do you remember your I mean, first exposure to it? My very first exposure was when, like, like I say, when I was really young, I think WCW was on on like Sunday afternoon or something in okay. Australia. Yeah. Um, so I remember watching that and I remember thinking, oh my God, this is awesome. And I'd kind of go and, you know, kind of backyard it a little bit, but also I was obese as a kid. So me trying to, you know, backyard, it was a pretty ridiculous sight. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's really interesting though, that like you kind of fell into it because you were essentially looking for work and it fit all the criteria for your creative outlets. So Would that be fair yeah. to say? Yeah, I th that, that is fair to say. Um, when I was 17, one of my best friends um, had cable TV and he was really into wrestling. So I got a chance then to kind of go to his house. Like I'd say to my mom, yeah, I'm going to hard devs house to watch wrestling. And, um, uh, sorry, I wouldn't say that. I'd say to my mom, I'm going to hard devs house to do homework. And we <laughs> show up, we just, we just watch wrestling. And like, and he had the game on the PlayStation as well. He had one of those original SmackDown games or something. So right. we just hang out watching wrestling and playing SmackDown, which is a good time. So um, what, what, do you remember like what, what you were watching back then? Like what era this was that you would Wait, if this stuff? was, it was Attitude Era. It was Attitude Era. Okay. And I remember loving X-Park. X-Park was my favorite wrestler. <laughs> so it would have been, it would have been when X-Park and the Road Dog. that's why it was that era. It was when X-Park and the Road Dog were tagging together. Okay, and like DX and all that stuff. All of that stuff, all yeah, that stuff. Steve Austin. And yeah, that was a great that, era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a fantastic era. I mean, that really was, you know, it was one of the golden eras, wasn't it? It was yeah. wonderful. Um, but I remember loving X Park because I was training Taekwondo at the time, and so X Park was doing all the jump kicks and everything. So I was like, "Oh yeah, this boy's my boy. He's doing all <laughs> my stuff." 
<laughs> I see. So how did you, what brought you to like Taekwondo and all that? Is that how you started losing weight is by through martial um, arts? Pretty much. I was you know, really fat as a kid. And so I got bullied for it. Um, but I kind of, like I say, wrestling wasn't accessible to me, but Kung Fu movies were because you could go and get them from the video shop. Mm -hmm. Um, so I loved watching Kung Fu movies. I loved the American ones. And I also liked like the Jackie Chan ones as well. So I was kind of, and like, I really loved the karate kid series. Um, and so I kind of, you know, I wanted to train and everything. And so when I was 13, I think there was Taekwondo club at school. When I got into high school, there was a Taekwondo club. So I said, all right, I'll have a crack at that. And that sort of became how I started to lose weight. But the other thing was I got bullied so much. I think I kind of just had some kind of subconscious urge to learn how to fight because I was getting my ass kicked all the time. So, <laughs> yeah. Right. And then so then you find wrestling again. And now this is your early 20s, you're saying? And yeah, halfway through my 20s. So this is this is a weird story. I when I'm a martial artist and everything and I'm an actor. And then I went through stunt training when I finished acting school. Trying to be an actor in Australia, there's no work at all for actors in Australia. My stunt teacher, who used to be uh, one of the Australians on Jackie Chan's stunt team, which is another story and for crazy, he says to me, you should go to Hong Kong because you'll be able to find work in Hong Kong. And even if it doesn't work out, you can go there, get, get a bit more experience, come back here, and then you're more employable. So I'm like, all right, cool. So I moved to Hong Kong, and it worked out really well. So I ended up staying there for six years in the end. Um, oh, but wow. one day, yeah, yeah. Uh, but one day I was at a local metal show, and um, I saw a kid wearing a shirt that said Hong Kong Pro Wrestling Federation. So I go up and talk to him, and I'm like, what's this? He's like, yeah, I'm a wrestler. We've got this club. Um we got this, this club out in the kind of the uh, industrial outskirts of Hong Kong. Hey, you want to come to training? I'm like, oh, yes, I do. So, so that was good. I, that's how I managed to actually train for the first time. Was this a, a Ho Ho Lum? Or, or... Ah, uh, he, Ho Ho was not the kid who I met at the show, but that kid took me to Ho Ho Lum. Oh, because that, so Ho Ho is the one who is in WWE now. Doing that's this, right classic he was that's a, he, right yeah so and now i think he's actually like in there full time so he trained you to be a wrestler ho ho was my very first wrestling coach wow yeah crazy right and yeah. and jason knew who was the other kid from hong kong who um was in the cruiserweight classic so ho ho was my first ever match and then jason was my third ever match Wow, that's so yeah. that's so great. Like their story is pretty insane in that they were just huge wrestling fans and there was no wrestling in Hong Kong, so they just started it themselves. Yeah, you know what? Freaking oh my god, man, Ho Ho, that guy really like I think people don't fully understand the extent of what he did in Hong Kong. There was there was no wrestling in Hong Kong. And also, but it was it not only was it no wrestling in Hong Kong, when you kind of understand Cantonese culture, it was almost like there was an anti-wrestling culture in that they would see like the Chinese kids would see wrestling and they would say, Oh, well that's some really violent foreign thing. Oh, we're not interested in that at all. <laughs> so what Ho Ho did like, I mean, uh, Jason as well, but really full credit to Ho Ho. He really built that thing from the ground up in Hong Kong and he was up against a lot of challenges. So Really, man, ho ho! I take my hat off to that guy, dude. He really has achieved a lot. Wow! So this, so he was your first wrestling coach, and I'm guessing yeah. everyone else in the class was from Hong Kong. You were the only non. Yeah, I was the I was the only foreigner. Before me, there had been some other guy, some other white guy who'd been involved, but then he'd stopped before I um before I came. But dude, it was freaking crazy because I remember I met this kid. So the kid I met at the metal show was named Madness. <laughs> so love i meet it. love it i meet madness and he takes me to training and so we go out into the he says meet me at this station at, on like a sunday afternoon at some station out in the middle of nowhere so i meet him and he takes me and i meet ho ho and we're walking along and they take me into this old industrial building so in hong kong pretty much every building is a skyscraper right and um what happened was do you remember back in like the 80s when you had your toys they would all say on the bottom of the made in Hong Kong. Right. Yeah. And then, and then that kind of switched in the nineties. It became made in Taiwan. Right. Yeah. Um, that meant that because there was this big, like kind of uh, manufacturing 
boom in the 80s in Hong Kong, there were all these kind of abandoned industrial buildings. So they were former warehouses and factories and things like this. But then once the industry all went to Taiwan, they sort of didn't really have much of a purpose anymore. So they take me to one of these old, um, out, out in the middle of nowhere, freaking industrial buildings. And it's kind of like, it, there's like cockroaches running around and it's kind of, it's one of those f- freight elevators. There's not a normal person elevator. There's one of those freight elevators that takes, you know, half an hour for the doors to close and all this kind of stuff, right? And they take me up to the fifth floor or whatever and they like unlock this huge ass door and they open up the door into this room. It's this little ass room. Like the room is slightly larger than a wrestling ring. And these kids have built their own freaking wrestling ring in the middle of this industrial building. This this was insane. I walked in, I was like, what the hell is this? And they're like, yeah, we 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 ordered the steel ourselves and we put it together. They had wow. this bunch of Yeah, they had this like set of photos of them like making the ring. I was like, what the <laughs> you guys made a ring? I was I'm like, dude, that's I've never made a ring. That was very impressive. So but like how did Ho Ho, how did he learn how to wrestle? You know, like how is he teaching you when nobody taught him? You know Yeah, I mean? I mean I mean so that's one of the things like uh, that he kind of, you know, needs credit for is that he um yeah but he really did forge the whole thing from the ground up. Um he had had a teacher uh, who lives in Guangzhou, which is in the south of mainland China. So it's like a two-hour train ride from Hong Kong. Um, uh-huh. He he and the other guys had trained with this guy, Slam. All the guys have awesome names. Slam is his <laughs> I name. Love it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they had trained with Slam in Guangzhou. Um, they had a former a former kind of you know ad hoc fed up there. Um, mm-hmm. So Ho Ho and the other guys had gone and trained with him. But, oh, my God, man, it's so ridiculous. Again, they show me photos from when they're, you know, when they're inverted commas training in China. And it's a ring that it looks like the most dangerous ring in the world. It's a ring on a rooftop. Oh, my God. And, <laughs> and dude, and there's a hole in the canvas. There's just this enormous <laughs> hole in the middle of the canvas. And so they're saying, yeah, we had to be really careful because we, we, when you were running the ropes, it was really easy to put your foot in the hole and kind of fall through the ring. Yeah, I'm like, I am like, what are you, the, the freaking, what are you doing? So, right. so they had trained with Slam to a certain extent in China. And so then he'd come back to Hong Kong. But this was, this was back... What Ho Ho and Jason both did is they both left Hong Kong and they trained overseas. So Ho Ho first went to the UK, I think, and he trained over there and then went to Japan. Jason went to America and then went to Japan. So then once they'd done that, they came back to Hong Kong and now it was okay. Yeah. And and so then it was, they could create the Fed as it is now. So they've done, like they know the proper system. But back then they trained a bit with Slam. Apart from that, they were kind of, to a certain extent, figuring it out. Yeah, uh, well, so. sure, as we all are in life. Well, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So, how long did you train? How long did you train there with them? I was there with them for like two or three years, I think. Um, I think about yeah, two or three years, something like that. And uh, then I realized that I was going to end up leaving Hong Kong and and left Hong Kong. And then you went to Japan, or what was that? Yeah, I, w- I went. I went back to Australia for a year, and I trained down there with uh, Riot City Wrestling. Okay. Um, and then I came to Japan. Okay. Now let's take a quick pause for the wrestling stuff. Now, metal. How did metal come into your life? I wanted to be a metal singer as my kind of original teenage dream when we were, you know, teenagers in school, trying to, you know, being asked by our career counselor, "What are you going to do when you leave this place?" Um, I wanted to be a metal singer originally. Um, and the situation I had was I didn't know how to scream. So I would kind of, I'd sit in my bed cause I wanted to scream, right? I was listening to bands like, um, I was listening to sort of machine head and, um, I hadn't gotten into slipknot yet, but, uh, I was kind of, yeah, I was kind of in my, I started in punk and then went into new metal and then went into real metal. Right. So I think at that time I was kind of in my new metal phase. I'm listening to like Limp Bizkit and Corn and things like that. That's, that's fine. right. That's and then, fine. Then, then, <laughs> that's fine. Exactly. It's a gateway drug, isn't yeah. it? And then from from there, I went into Machine Head and Slipknot. And right. Like you got to start somewhere. You got to start. Exactly. Yeah, if you don't right. have an older brother or an older sister, you know, how are you going to get exposed to the underground stuff? You got to work your that, way in. Yeah, exactly. You got to find the gateways. That's yeah. right. Um, 
So I re- remember really wanting to be a metal singer, but I didn't know how to scream. So I'd like sit in my bedroom trying to figure it out and just kind of hurting myself and whatnot. I did that for years and couldn't figure it out. So, so finally I went, all right, I don't think this is going to work, at least not, not in the short term. Um, but it's a funny story. So I said, okay, well, I can't scream. So that means I can't be a metal singer. So I went off to be an actor instead. Fast forward several years, I'm in Hong Kong and I was doing stunt work and whatnot, but I also started doing a lot of voice work. So I was dubbing Japanese anime into English and that became my full-time job over there for a while. Um, wow, and you kind of just ran into like so, someone you knew just was like, oh, they need new people to dub stuff. Yeah, I was kind of networking and whatnot over there and I met this right. girl who was working for the dubbers and then when... Um, when uh, an availability came up, she let me know. I went and auditioned and got the job. But what's funny is dubbing taught me how to scream because it was from dubbing like monsters and things like that when I had to, you know, be like, well, growl, growl, and do like growly kind of voices. That taught me how to scream. So as soon as I knew how to scream without hurting myself, I was like, oh, well chains are off let's go find a band so i went and i found a band in hong kong and that didn't really work out but then i started ladybeard activities after that the concept of ladybeard that yeah. happened after you were already starting a uh, wrestling training <laughs> all these stories are long stories that end up intermingling i apologize for jumping around in no time. no my first ever cross-dressing adventure was when i was 14 when a friend of mine had a school uniform party and i said wouldn't it be funny if i wore my big sister's school dress to this thing so i go wear my big sister's school dress and all my mates are 14 year old boys like oh you wear a dress yeah <laughs> was kind of, all right. the way, the way um, a 14 year old would react that, that's exactly how a 14 year old is <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah um but then, so after that, I started going to other parties and like, you know, rock shows and whatnot, wearing my sister's school dress. And then another friend of mine, her sister sold me a school dress. There was, there used to be a festival every year in Australia called the Big Day Out. You know the Big Day Out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a big famous festival, right? Like, it was yeah, like that's the biggest right. metal festival of the year right there. It was, yeah, it was the biggest music festival of any kind in the year in Australia. Yeah. Um, and so every year I would wear a school dress to the big day out and they would have these super screens where they put up people, put up photos of people dressed like freaks in the crowd. And so I'd always get my photo on the super screen and be like, woohoo, the super screen. So I kind of cross-dressed for years in Australia. Then when I started, then I went when I moved to Hong Kong, I like the first time I ever went to a party in a, in a dress, people just lost their minds, right? Cause in the Western world, if a dude puts on a dress, it's like, ah, ha ha, but it's not a huge deal. In conservative Cantonese Hong Kong, dude, I put on a dress and people were like, you're insane. Like you're this is insane. offensive. Well, it, it, cool. this, now this, this is very interesting. They said it would be offensive if I were Chinese, but because I'm not Chinese, it's hilarious. Interesting. So, yeah, so that's a whole, that's a whole different discussion about, I guess, uh, cultural conceptions and so forth. But – the reaction that I got for it was, you're the funniest, the craziest person I've ever seen in my life. I'm like, wow, okay. So I started like, going to parties and whatnot in a dress in Hong Kong, and people were like, oh my God, you're in a dress, and it was awesome and everything. So then, then when it came to time to have my first match, because it was shortly after I'd been partying a lot in a dress, it was shortly after that that I started wrestling, and then we, Ho Ho was having this public show. And so he said, do you want to wrestle on it? And um, I was like, I'm going to need a gimmick. Yeah, I'm going to need some kind of character. And he's like, yeah, what do you want yours to be? And I said, uh, what if I put on a, a Lolita dress and I call myself Ladybeard? And Ho Ho goes, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> every, every other wrestler in Hong Kong had the gimmick of, I am a wrestler. So, so yeah, I'm just, tough. I'm slam. Yeah. That's, that's exactly, I'm a girl. Exactly. exactly right. <laughs> so I show up. I show up in this low leader dress. Um, and so here was my concept, right? I'm like, okay, I'm this big, hairy, white guy speaking my terrible Cantonese, wearing a dress. I'm going to go into the ring and I'm going to be the biggest heel that Hong, Hong Kong's ever seen. Everyone's going to hate me. I'm going to be, everyone's going to think I'm terrible, right? So my plan is to go and be this big, horrible heel, right? Also, I was bigger than all the other guys. That's the other thing. Everyone else was very small and very skinny, right? So um, it's my plan. All right, Lady Beard, I'm going to be the company heel. Here we go. Nah, I go into the ring and everyone loved it. 
everyone loved it. It was like, oh my God, dude in a dress, woo! So then, <laughs> then overnight, I become the most popular wrestler in Hong Kong. I'm like, what the? This was not what I was aiming for. But um, I said, then on my second match, my second match before they announced me, uh, everyone like they're going, and now introducing from Australia, and then the the audience starts going, Lady Bid, Lady Bid. So I'm behind wow. the curtain, and I'm like, and but again, I had the plan to go into the ring and be the heel. And Wait, I remember being your like, first well, show? I'm sorry, like this is your first show, or you've already had a mat. This is another this this is uh, my very first show is the one when I went in thinking I was going to be a heel, and okay, then they so all that loved happened. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that so happened. This is your second then, show, and you're my second ever changed. show. My second yeah. ever show, I get the chant, and I'm like, well. I guess I'm not a heel, so I go out <laughs> through the curtain smiling and waving. <laughs> so, right, right, wow. Yeah, um, but that first ever match, man, that was ridiculous. I remember, because I'd only trained for like two months or something. Mm-hmm. I remember I turned up, and because I'd done stunts, I you know, I could already bump and everything. And so I caught on to a lot of the basics reasonably quickly. And so then two months later... I'm on this show. I remember standing, and by the way, when I say this show, like I say, it's in this tiny room, which is slightly bigger than the ring. It's There's like dust everywhere because it's a concrete floor and they didn't have any kind of like floor covering. So there's just dust coming up through the floor, like that white kind of concrete dust everywhere. There's like 50 people packed into this little place. When I say behind the curtain, I mean there's two kids holding broomsticks with a, like a sheet strung across the top of it. And that's the locker room, right? So, I love so, it. I love it. Dude, it was, it was like the most underground thing you can ever imagine. It was fantastic. But I remember I'm, before my first match, I'm standing behind this sheet and I, and I had this profound moment when I said to myself, what the hell am I doing? I'm dressed as, I'm wearing a <laughs> dress, wearing a dress. I'm about to, go out in front of people doing this thing, this activity that I've only done for two months, speaking a language I don't really speak. What the, what the hell is wrong with me? But at that stage, it was too, too late, late to, to back, back out. out. Right. <laughs> so, so, so I had to do it, man. Uh, good fun. But now here we are. It's created, created my entire career. So so you were doing this wrestling stuff uh, in, in Hong Kong. Then you said you moved back to Australia? Oh, that's right. So about three years after that, I moved back to Australia. Wow. So you were wrestling in Hong Kong for three years in these small shows yeah. and training. Yeah, that's and right. That. Yeah, um, that's right. So then when you when, when did the idea happen to incorporate metal in, into the act? Um, about a year after I started wrestling. So mm-hmm. uh, my metal show, as it began, I think we spoke about this last time I was on the podcast. Yes, my metal the career. Podcast, yeah. Yeah, my metal career as it began was I um, started singing metal covers of Cantonese pop songs because my favorite songs you know, in the Western world were always metal covers of pop songs right? because I found them fantastic and hilarious because you're so used to hearing the pop song and then you hear the metal cover of it and it subverts your usual way of thinking about the song. And I, f- I find them just so joyous and so hilarious. When I got to Hong Kong, I found all these awesome Cantonese pop songs with these wonderful melodies and whatnot that no one was making metal covers of. And I kind of said, wow, someone should make metal covers of them. And then a few years later, I decided I'm going to make metal covers of them. So that was the show as it originally started. And I started doing the show about a year after I'd started wrestling as Lady Beard. And so I said, well, I've got this um, character that I'm, you know, wrestling as I'm going to keep the same character and start doing the metal show. And my original plan was to interlock all of the work. So the storylines from the ring would then carry over into the storylines of the live metal show. And the plan was to never have two metal shows be the same. Every time there was going to be, yeah, every time the story was going to be different, I would have, you know, like in the, in the venue, in the um, live house, I would have wrestlers come on stage and attack me and whatnot. So my first ever metal show. Ah, I remember this. My first ever metal show. Ho Ho Lun comes on stage. After, after one of my songs, he comes on and like blindsides me. And he takes the microphone. And he's like, he's like, hey, Lady Beard, what do you think you're doing? Bastardizing my culture like this with your ridiculous <laughs> heavy metal singing. I'll show you how to sing this song properly. Then he goes into singing like the original version of the song I've just sung. <laughs> so oh, then I get up. Amazing. It was awesome. We got up, we had this spot. It was fantastic. 
I end up, I can't remember what I did. I gave him So a, all of your peers something. were kind of like, obviously they were in on the joke and they were supportive. Like Hoho was like cool with it and everything. And he, he thought it was Yeah, fun. yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were fantastic about it. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome that everyone kind of contributed. And then I'm guessing over time it kind of morphed into what it is today. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I remember uh, the first time I saw it is uh, we have a videographer who's actually from Taiwan. His name is Frank Huang. And yeah. he went over there and, and shot a concert of you. And I just yeah. saw the thumbnail of, you know, you and Pigtails. And I'm like, what the hell is this? And then I just remember <laughs> watching it. And then, like, I didn't even, you know, I, I knew at this point I knew nothing about Lady Bird. <laughs> and just you, know, yeah. you had, like, a villain come out and hit you with a chair. And I'm like, this is officially gone from, you know, the wildest thing I've seen to the best thing I've seen. <laughs> you know? uh, thanks, bro. It was great. Right, at, that time, at that time, when Frank said, I'm hooked up with Metal Ejection, I had no idea, no idea that you were a metal... Uh, no idea that you're a wrestling fan oh yeah so um of course that would have had a big impact on you awesome yeah yeah no, that show yeah. that show the one that frank films oh that was awesome because that was uh that was at that stage i'd already moved to japan and that was my first show in taiwan at mm -hmm. the time so frank was in taiwan i go to taiwan i do my show in taiwan it was packed out like it was this little 500 person venue and we'd packed like 800 people in there or something so and there was no air conditioner so it was really sweaty and really hot and kind of horrible right but a lot of those fans had kind of become fans of me from like my cosplay stuff and whatnot on the internet mm -hmm. so they had never really seen metal before and a lot of them had definitely never seen wrestling before <laughs> so when so when the heel came out and blindsided me and everything they thought that i was actually being attacked by some guy they it, had no idea that, that it was, was fascinating it was so great so it, it was like, it and was, they were so rabid for you too, even before the wrestler. Like, like they were fanatical. It, it was as if were. like Madonna, Madonna was performing. You know, or like, yeah, they they're wonderful, man. The, the Taiwan fans are fantastic. I've got a lot of time for Taiwan. It's really wonderful down there. Um, yeah, we were doing that spot through the audience, and there's an old lady, like she would have been in her like fifties or sixties or something, and she's grabbing the other wrestler, going, "Stop it! Leave him alone! He hasn't <laughs> done anything to you." <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, yeah, good fun. So you're doing this stuff, and then uh, uh, I think like a year or two ago now, DDT calls, which is this niche Japanese promotion, but. Mm -hmm. Perfect for Ladybeard because their mm. whole thing is essentially absurd kind of comedy wrestling. Mm. Mm, that's right. That's right. It's fantastic wrestling in DDT. It's so weird. Every day I'm like, oh, God, what the hell is going on? It's fantastic. It's really wonderful. So, how, yeah, did so they, how do they find you? How did that come about? So like I say, I was in Hong Kong for three years. I moved back to Australia. I trained with Riot City. And then when I came to Japan, my goal was to wrestle for ddt i mean my wrestling goal was to wrestle for ddt so you were already familiar with them and you were like this is the place for me this is how they'll th yeah they'll know how to treat ladies <laughs> that's that's right I was, <laughs> yeah i did my research of all the japanese companies and i was like it's either osaka pro or ddt and maybe Ryukyu Dragon, which is the um, the company in Okinawa, but it's like they can't, they're a bit different. So, yeah. So I was like either Osaka Pro or um, or DDT. So, so hold on, if, if I could just pause for a second here, this is very yep. fa this is fascinating to me. Like I, I'm I'm trying to get more acclimated with Japanese pro wrestling. Mm. Know, obviously, I'm very familiar with New Japan. Uh, mm. I know a little bit about DDT, a little bit about Dragon Gate, but it seems like there's like, you know quite a few promotions all over mm. the country in, yep. in, when you're in japan is it easy to follow all of these promotions like how do you keep up with all of them it's funny right because in japan there's a very good pro wrestling infrastructure as in people like like pro wrestling's everyone knows what it is kind of like america everyone knows what it is and there's a lot of fans but you know unlike america geographically japan's so much smaller right that there's you can kind of access things much better right um so there's a lot of interest, and I guess it's kind of like bands or musicians in the Western world, as in there's a lot of kind of smaller groups who kind of get together and end up putting on shows, and they might only be shows for 100 or 200 people, but they're still shows. Right. And um, they still end up being fairly high quality as well. In America, you know, obviously everyone knows pro wrestling, but there's still kind of this, you know, stigma I feel with – part of the population where you know people some people get it it's like oh it's not for me but some people are like 
Really? You, it's fake, you know. Nah. Like, Toshiro's fake. <laughs> is it, what's it like in Japan? Is it more respected? Is it is it kind of like like everyone kind of accepts that it's a form of entertainment, even if it's not for them? I think it is fairly well accepted. I mean, you know, I think all the people who I'm talking to, they hear I'm a pro wrestler, and it's unlikely that they're going to say, oh, I hate pro wrestling. So right. maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm just getting people being nice to me. Also, but that's it's, not the culture in Japan to be so, so blunt. It's to, right? be, to be rude about things. That's exactly right. You, yeah, kind of, yeah. you have to be polite to people. Um, so, no, I think it, it generally is um, – better respected here okay. than it is in the West. Um, I've forgotten the second half of your question. Oh, so uh, no, you were talking about how you pick DDT. It was either that or Osaka. That's right, yeah. So, um, yeah, I did my research. DDT is in Tokyo and Osaka is in Osaka. So that, you know, I was moving to Tokyo. Right. So that kind of makes the decision for me. Um, but also I think Osaka, I can't remember, they closed down for a while or something. So that option was gone anyway. But what happened was, so I'm in Australia training, getting ready to come over. And I'm like, okay, I want to wrestle for DDT. I had a contact in DDT and I was writing to her, but I wasn't really getting a response and whatnot. So what I did through um, a kind of a, through the wrestlers network, I got in touch with Kenny Omega who, by the way, is not only like the best wrestler on the pre- on the planet, also lovely, lovely guy, really, really good guy. Oh, that's, um, that's great. Yeah, he's a fantastic guy. So I got in touch with Kenny and I sent him my videos. He wrote back to me and, and said, you know, I think uh, he, he was still in DDT at the time. He yeah. said, I think you've got something that our fans could really get behind. So I'll try and, you know, show it to someone in the office. So he went and he was, you know, helping me out. God bless him. Wow. Yeah, God bless him, man. What a good guy. And at the same time, so that happened about within a week or two of me moving to Japan. I got that reply from Kenny. So I'm like, yes. But a week after that, I was used to the hustle, you see, because in Hong Kong, I'd have to, I had to hustle up my whole career myself. And there was – the funny thing is about hustling is people seem to think there's – rules but there's no freaking rules you just go and you figure it out like i think yeah. i think people living in los angeles trying to be actors kind of get that sense you just you just freaking meet people and you figure it out you let yeah. them know who you are you know same with um, metal i mean I feel, yeah like, same I mean, that's right exactly yeah. you just freaking there's no rules you just go get it done so i was used to that from hong kong right so ddt i found i looked on the their website and i found they were having this public show and so I said, okay, I'm going to go to this show, right? So it was this, when I say public show, I mean it was um, sponsored by a shopping mall or something or by a, like a council or something. Okay. So it's out, out and open air outside um, and it's like in the middle of a, like a public plaza kind of thing. Um, so I go to this show, right, and I watch wrestling and it's fantastic. And I had my DVD of my matches and whatnot with me. Here's what happened. This was, ah, uh, this was just the best thing that ever happened right so i'm standing in the audience i don't have a very good view i'm standing on this little freaking wall thing with my buddy watching so dan shokudino who is a wrestler who wrestles for ddt who does this offensively stereotypical gay gimmick he he's the guy who he does what he calls the uh the cock bottom, I think he calls it. He gives you a gives you a rock bottom with your with your junk, and he does the uh, the Dino driver when he puts your head down his pants and then gives you a pile driver. You know this guy? Have you seen I've the videos? I've absolutely this guy, right? seen videos. What, what, yeah. I, what is his name though? I, I'm not familiar with the name, but definitely know who you're talking about. The pile his name driver. is it, yeah, that, exactly. His name yeah. is Dun Shoku Dino. Dun Shoku um, Dino. And, okay. and if there was there was a uh, there was a gif that went around of him and Joey Ryan when Joey Ryan was doing, you know, the, uh, the penis flex. Right. The king and, of dong and style. Cause... That's, that's exactly right. So that match was with Dino, the gift, okay, the really popular okay. gift that went around. He was wrestling. Gear, you know, and also there, so, I believe there's one of him and like Kota Ibushi doing a back and forth kiss thing. Yes. Where like, yes. Where it was like chops, but with kisses, which I thought. And then it turns into the kisses. That yeah. was, one of, and then one, he's, one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. <laughs> did it so good. And then he starts passing out and everything is so yeah. funny. Oh my God. So Dino, right. When he makes his re- ring entrance, he like, he kisses male audience members on his way to the ring. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I don't know how this happened. This was so good. So Dino is coming to the ring and he's kissing men. And then <laughs> okay, we're watching and laughing and everything. Then he sees me. Right. And I guess it's you know, part of being a foreigner. Now, in you're Japan. in you stand out as... or, or you're, you're no, dressed no, as, I was, as a man. I was in, I was in, di- I was in disguise. <laughs> I okay. Okay. So I'm in disguise. Right. He sees me and he just 
beelines at me, right? He beelines, like I said, we're standing on this little wall. It's about a foot high or so. Mm -hmm. He gets up on this wall next to me, grabs me and kisses me on the mouth, right? Mm -hmm. And so everyone else, normally they get the kiss and they just sort of flop around, right? Because I'm a freaking (laughs) wrestler. I did this huge sell. So I'm doing this big pro wrestling sell as he's kissing me. And then he leaves and I'm like wiping my lips going, what the hell? And all this kind of stuff. So all the fans around me are going, ah, they're taking photos and whatnot. So that was awesome. Dino goes to the ring and he has his match and whatnot. After the show finishes, I'm trying to find Kenny because I'd had contact with Kenny earlier and he'd had a match, but then he kind of went away and we couldn't find him again. So me and my buddy are there and we're trying to find someone we can talk to, to kind of, you know, hustle with. And it wasn't really working. And we're like, uh, okay, all right, we're leaving. And as we're leaving, we're um, going back to the train and the referee, the DDT referee is also going to the train Mm -hmm. and he walks past me and he goes, that was a great sell because he recognizes me from the crowd, right? He goes, that was a fantastic sell. And I said to him, thanks, I'm a wrestler. Can I give you my DVD of matches? And he goes, okay, okay. So I give him my DVD. I'm like, yes. I did it. (laughs) Figured it out. Figured it out. So that's how I got in with DDT. Long that's story. Great. No, that was a great, that's a, a wonderful story. So then obviously they saw your work and they're like, uh, this is perfect for us. <laughs> that's right. In. God bless. It was good timing because so they used to have a subsidiary called Union Pro, mm-hmm. um, which has now shut its doors, unfortunately. But at the time they were looking for a, like a new foreigner for Union. So Union was, would at any given time always have one foreigner wrestling in the company. And sometimes it was guys that they brought in overseas and sometimes the guys who were living in Japan. So they were looking for a new foreigner for Union. So they brought me in to be that foreigner. And then eventually you graduated up to the main show because I have seen you on some DDT shows. That I've- that's right. That's right. So um, then I started, I did a few shows with DDT while I was still in Union. But then Union ended up uh, closing for whatever reason. I don't know why. Uh, I was in Union for about two years and then it closed. Uh, and I was like on every Union show for two years. Then it closed. And so all the Union wrestlers now have to go somewhere. So... A bunch of us went to DDT. The so okay, so the DDT group. There's several companies within DDT. So there's DDT itself, and then there's about five or six subsidiary companies, right? So Union was one such subsidiary company, and so then me and a bunch of other wrestlers went up to DDT, up to the main DDT. Some of the Union wrestlers went to Basara, which is another subsidiary company. It was a new subsidiary company that they'd started. And I think one or two went to DNA, which was a different subsidiary company they had just started as well. So, and then a couple went and became freelancers and whatnot. So all the union wrestlers kind of split up and went to different places. But that put me in the main DDT roster. So that's where I am now. So you're still active on DDT. How often does DDT have shows? I know they just started like an on-demand network, right? Yeah, they did. That's right. DDT Universe, bless them. Mm -hmm. Um... Uh, they have, I mean, they have shows all the time. They have three a week or something like that. I think normally, uh, depending on the season, Mm -hmm. but they have a lot every week. I personally don't wrestle that much because I have all my other, well, because I have my other stuff that I do as well. So this, the scheduling gets quite difficult. Um, so I only end up wrestling once, once maybe a month or once every two months or so. I tend to do the bigger, bigger shows, right? They bring me in for the big shows. Um, yeah, but they You're have a big a lot star, of, of course. They got to bring in oh. the big names for the big show. Ah, <laughs> small potato, small potato, big fish, small pond. <laughs> have you ever wrestled in Corican Hall? Yeah, have you made it there? great there. It's great there. I love wrestling Corican Hall. It seems like a lovely, lovely venue to, to perform. Yeah, in. it's a great venue, and the uh, the National Sumo Stadium is fantastic to wrestle in. Mm-hmm. It's wonderful because you go into that place. And it's just, you feel history soaking out of the walls. You go in and there's all around, like, the top, they have, um, like, paintings of every Yokozuna ever. So Uh you walk in, yeah, you walk in there and you're like, whoa, it really is, like, the atmosphere in there is fantastic. So now you're doing the the wrestling occasionally. I have to ask because I'm a big fan of it. Like, I've ever uh, interacted with Kota Ibushi at all? Mm. He's lovely. I love him. He's lovely. He's such a good guy. He's fantastic. Now, do you ever? Yeah. Are there any wrestlers uh, in DDT that you talk about metal with, or, you, or that's kind of separate? Oh yeah, there's um a couple. A lot of those guys are metalheads, actually. A oh, really? lot of them. Yeah. So right now, the big heel faction is a bunch of guys called Damnation. 
and I think they're all metalheads from what I know. That's um, awesome. <laughs> yeah, but there's also a lot of the younger guys are also metalheads. So, uh, like I said, there's this subsidiary company called DNA, mm-hmm. um, which stands for uh, fuck, uh, I can't remember what it stands for. Um, but anyway, that's kind of the new boy breeding ground federation so all the new kids in ddt now i guess it's kind of like ddt's equivalent of nxt you sort of go into you go into dna first yeah sort of developmental Mm -hmm. but also the style they do is slightly different they're focusing more on like sports wrestling right yeah so um a couple of the guys there are big metalheads and they're playing in bands and whatnot one of them's huge on beatdown hardcore. So at the last show, he comes up to me and he's like, hey, listen to this. And he starts playing his beatdown hardcore band. And I'm like, yeah, man. He's like, <laughs> yeah, man. Great. Come to a show. I'm like, oh, I will. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, a beatdown hardcore show in Japan sounds like a good time to me. Oh, uh, dude. <laughs> when he had his show, sadly, I was overseas and I couldn't go. But I want to go. I'm sure it would be an absolute freak yeah. show. I think it would be fantastic. I actually uh, heard an interview with Kenny Omega. He was actually interviewed by Chris Jericho a few weeks ago. Oh, he, yeah. And he mentioned how his high school teacher gave him a Blind Guardian CD that belonged to Chris Jericho when he was in high school. Ah, get and, out of here, really? And it was so awesome to me that Kenny Omega listens to Blind Guardian. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Oh, my God. That's brilliant. Uh, he got it was that was Jericho's CD that he got. Did they go to the same high school? His teacher went to high school with Jericho, or something like his teacher was oh. friends with Jericho, or something like that. That's yeah. awesome because yeah. are they both they're both from the same place in Canada? Yeah, yeah, they're both from uh, Winnipeg. Of course, they're both from Winnipeg. Yep. Yeah, right. So they, they knew the same people. That's fantastic. Kenny's a good guy, man. He's a good guy. Oh my god. So now let's talk about. What, uh, a little bit about your music, you know, we're, we're kind of running out of time here. So what what is going on in, in the musical world of Lady Beard? You mentioned oh. uh, a new project. Oh. Oh, that's right. I've just announced a new project. I've just announced my new project. So that's a new project with a pro wrestler as well. Um, so we just started this new project called Deadlift Lolita, which features me and the talented and beautiful Reika Psyche. So Reika is uh, in Japan pop singers referred to as idols so reika is a bodybuilding idol and she also last year started wrestling as well so she's now a wrestler too so we wrestled together in ddt and she also wrestles for wrestle one and tokyo joshi pro which is another one of ddt's subsidiary companies okay yeah so she is um we met her sometime last year and she when she kind of like she had this big explosion in popularity last year she released an image dvd which is uh it's a it's a japanese concept it's very hard to describe to westerners it's kind of it's a kind of like a modeling dvd i suppose um she released her modeling dvd last year and it kind of went straight to number one on the japan dvd charts so she boomed in popularity last year and when that happened i hadn't met her yet and my manager found out about her and said, oh my god, look at this girl. Oh god, she's a wrestler. Oh god, she's wrestling for DDT. Oh, she's on the same show as you a few months from now. Oh my god. So my manager saw her, and she's Reka is this really cute, tiny, jacked little powerhouse, right? Mm-hmm. So um, uh, abbreviating a long story, we met, and we decided, hey, let's do a project together. Because my last project, Lady Baby, kind of fell by the wayside uh, about a year ago. Uh, so we were sort of, you know, thinking about, okay, what are we going to do next? And we were throwing various ideas around. When we met Reka, we said, wow, this is a match made in heaven. So I've teamed up with Reka, and we are a new duo called Deadlift Lolita, and we are going to take the world by storm. I love it. So, what, yeah. so there's going to be some music? When can we expect some music? There's going to be some music. If you go to our website, dl-lolita.com there's a sample of the first track which is up there now and we're going to be releasing more samples of the new work throughout this month please go there and check it out it's going to be more what i call kawaii core so it's kawaii hardcore i guess similar to baby metal style really easiest way to explain it to everybody it's a kawaii metal so reika sings with her angelic voice i scream everyone's happy but what i'm very excited about is on this project for the first time really i'm getting to sing clean vocals as well Mm -hmm. so yeah i've always been able to sing clean vocals but i've never been really given permission to do it on any of my projects thus far everyone's kind of you know asked me to do a project with them and said yeah no we just we just want you to scream 
So very exciting for me that finally I get to sing clean on Dead the Floor Leader. And rika has got a beautiful voice, and she is also, she's an incredible dancer. That's really one of the amazing things about her. When you look at her, she's jacked, like her arms and shoulders are huge. Uh, she's got a really cute face, and her and she has legs like a horse. Her legs are enormous. They're so big. But despite being so big, she re- like her dancing is really incredible. It's really fantastic. She's basically a... 100 miles an hour energy slam. I'm a 100 miles an hour energy slam. I guess together it's going to be a 200 miles an hour energy slam. It's going to be the greatest <laughs> stage show ever seen. I'm into it. Thanks, bro. You got to Thank bring it to much. America. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. We definitely do. I can't wait. Awesome. Well, uh, I really appreciate You know, we've got way over uh, the usual interviews, but this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion for me and uh, oh, thank you, you sir. nothing to worry about because there were plenty of great stories to share just the whole just training in Hong Kong I can't even imagine it was so <laughs> ridiculous man oh my god it was such a wild ride it was ridiculous uh, thank you for thank you for letting me talk that was I rambled and rambled and rambled just now no, I apologize it was great there's nothing to apologize I re- reject your apology <laughs> I chop it down because this is amazing <laughs> Oh, thank you, sir. I'm glad you're you approved. So thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, bro. It's awesome. great to talk to you. And yeah. um, Squared Circle Pit listeners, everybody stay metal. Keep listening to Square Circle Pit. The 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 Square